Welcome, everybody, to Victory Circle Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Wilson. Today, we have WTA professional tennis player, Sophia Shapatava from Georgia. And Georgia, the country, ladies and gentlemen, not the state in the United States where I'm from. <laughs> How are you doing, Sophia? Thank you. How are you? Um, that was very important to say that I'm from the Republic of Georgia because in U.S. people don't really like associate with the country. Everyone goes to Atlanta. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'm from Atlanta. So, you know, I know that there's that there would actually be a lot of confusion about that had I not said that. <laughs> I do have Georgia Bulldogs t-shirt. Just, you? You know. <laughs> Just uh, to let you know. Awesome. So, yeah. That's great. Okay, so it's such a pleasure to have you, Sophia. Um, Sophia, was it your dream to be a professional tennis player from the beginning when you were a kid? Uh, not really. No, not really. I actually wanted to be a doctor since uh, since I remember myself. I used to play doctors. We got me into school with a stronger math and uh, the school that teaches biology. Tennis was kind of thing because I got very fat to be very honest when I was a kid because I didn't move I used to play piano I used to study a lot so I was sitting most of the time so and I like to eat I, I still do so, <laughs> so yeah we got me to tennis so I could move a little bit and then I actually got into it but I was almost 11 years old so no one had an ambition that I would become a tennis player actually and then when I was 13 in summer my mom said like okay let's just play one tennis tournament for fun like hmm. local and I won it and then I was like oh my god that's awesome so I started to play everything national that I could from that that time on and then when I was like around 16 years old I had to go to actually medical college uh, to start to pre-study for medical university uh, and I still played tennis and uh, I actually was trying to go to university in USA but no universities gave a scholarship for medical and like this kind of professions. I had to take like something more economics or humanitarian, you know, so uh, that didn't uh, go through as I planned. And then by the age of now 19, my mom told me, okay, you're allowed to be a tennis player only if you finish your education. So somewhere around 19 years old, that was like kind of decided that I'm going to be a tennis player. But up until then, there was a doctor going to be there somewhere. <laughs> Didn't happen. But, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. So then um, when you decided to go professional as a tennis player, how old were you? Uh, well, in my head, I was professional tennis player since I was like 14. Wow. But when I actually started to play some tournaments, ITFs, like I traveled a couple of times first time, like outside of Georgia, I was like 19. Okay. So then um, did you ever go to the United States to play tennis or were you just basically uh, based in Georgia? Oh, no, I was based in Georgia. I mean, my family, like, like if, if we put it like shortly, my country is ex-Soviet country. So my parents didn't really, after that time, didn't really have that much of money to actually send me somewhere for tennis. So I was practicing all my life in Georgia and playing everything that's actually around Georgia, like Ukraine, Belarus, Turkey. And this, I actually didn't travel that much till later on in my career. So it was just Georgia, Turkey. Armenia, Belarus, like this type of countries, like cheaper, closer, everything that you can reach by bus mostly. So, yeah. Did you have any challenges along the way of uh, becoming professional? Yeah, a lot, a lot, <laughs> a lot. Like the country where I'm leaving, most of the people struggle with everyday life, like food and everything. Like imagine the mediocre, not even minimal, like medium salary in Georgia is like $200, $300 per month. Oh, wow. So with with that amount of money, people are really struggling for food, electricity bills. So tennis is something so luxurious that, I mean, it's out of the question even. Like me and there are a couple of tennis players from Georgia that still compete and are playing actually good tennis. And when we used to say we're more or less same age and we when we used to say that like we want to be a professional tennis player, everyone were like, I mean, are you kidding? We don't know if we have dinner, you know? <laughs> so it's like don't be that ambitious you know so and my parents also like they supported me that but in their head they kind of knew like it's like a done deal because it's impossible so it was like when I look back right now in my career I have no idea how I got where I got how I got to any tournament or any grand slam uh, 
I have no idea how I survived the life. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> And I would never do that again. Definitely never do that again because it was very hard. It still is, and um, people don't see it because my career high in singles is 180 in the world, and my career high in doubles is 130. And they go like, "Oh, it's not top 100." But for me, it's a lot because the first tournament I traveled to, I had only like 10 or 20 dollars in my pocket, mm. and I knew that if I didn't win a match, I wouldn't pay for a hotel. And there were days where I didn't eat and I played a match there were days where I just literally spent a night on the train station and I played a match next day wow. and people don't know it you know and it kind of it, it gets easier to talk about it but you go through this stuff and you appreciate your achievements way more and well it, it's very hard it was very hard and I'm very proud to where I went to but like, I would never do it again <laughs> I would not I would not do it again and I wouldn't advise anyone to do it. But like, you know, I was a kid. I had an ambition. I had a dream. So it was worth it then. Yeah. I mean, um, God, that's a testament to how far you, you're, you'll be willing to go through something in order yeah. to get what you want. Um, yeah, that, exactly. that's, that's phenomenal, though. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I, I do think like something, this, this is something for me, like the stories I have for myself, like some things that my husband knows about me at this point, like, you know, what my family went through, like, we appreciate everything we've done, how we've done and how we achieved it. That's why for me, every Georgian tennis player that actually competes is something that's like almost miraculous from where we come from. That's why, like, you know, we appreciate our achievements a lot because we know how, at what cost they came. But I mean, obviously no one else knows it, but yeah, it was a lot of obstacles. Like it's not the tennis country. Right, right. And then, um, I mean, are there any companies that sponsor tennis players coming out of Georgia right now? Oh, no, no. Uh, like, you know, our country is very little country and we have very good rugby teams, to be honest. And there are many people who wrestle and this stuff. But uh, tennis is not really like it got way more popular ever since Nicolas Basilashvili. He used to be top 15 in the world. He's a great tennis player. It got a bit more popular with people. But, um, you know, when I was 23 years old, I got first time into a Grand Slam, into Australian Open qualifying, and I was trying to find a sponsor to actually get there because it was very expensive. And uh, Well, the thing I got, like, actually from uh, a minister of my country, sports minister, he told me, like, you know our country, you're like... A good looking girl like get married have kids like tennis is really not our sport please don't <laughs> do that so i actually didn't go to australia that year because i i, I didn't manage to find a sponsorship to even get there so mm. uh, it's, it's unfortunately it's still more or less the same situation still more or less like uh, there's so many talented kids in our country like you can go there and see on one court, more talented people that you could see, like, in, I, I'm, I'm living in Germany now, and, like, I, I can go through five, six clubs and see maybe one or two kids that you watch, and you go, like, oh, this kid could play great. Like, in Georgia, you can say that about, like, eight out of ten kids, but eight out of ten kids would never even afford a practice level on a tournament or a competition. So, talent stays just talent, unfortunately. Well, for now. Right. For the future. Yes. Um, hopefully, you know, from this conversation, we can do something about that. <laughs> well, let's see. I'm, I'm only up for it. Exactly. Okay. Um, from the pandemic, Sophia, you know, we've been dealing with a lot of mental health issues, um, you know, starting with um, Naomi Osaka, who is, uh, yeah. very, who is very gracious to share her, her story after of course. Uh, what happened in the media. But um, have you ever been through any mental health issues yourself? Oh, yeah, a good bit, actually. Uh, I've learned a lot. I used to really not share anything uh, before at all. Um, I have pretty strong character, if I might say that about myself, like the way I've been brought up. But well, whenever I had issues or I was anxious, like, you know, anxiety attacks, panic attacks, uh, depression, I always used to keep it in myself because I thought people would be like judgmental and they won't get it. So mm. I kept good good deal of it in me and it actually got worse with that. So I learned on the way that when you share, 
I mean, you also can help other people because they relate at some point and maybe they also feel more free to talk to you about it. And then you talk and when you talk it out, it gets better. And you also find solutions to everything a little bit better and you get better advices and some people that maybe went through this. Uh, but yeah, I did have a lot, like, as I said, like I told you shortly, like what I've been through. So there was a lot of times when I was like very depressed, uh, uh, when I was a kid, I used to have a lot of panic attacks for several reasons, not only tennis related. There was a lot of difficulties in my family as well. Mm. And lately I got very tired, to be honest, uh, not not to exaggerate it's not like i'm all calm and butterflies now like i i had a very bad period this pandemic was not great not great for anyone not only yeah. me but also after pandemic i had very bad period and actually right now i'm taking a little break from tennis from traveling to reflect calm down spend some time with my family uh and uh and I don't think I'm the only one or Naomi Osaka is the only one. There just happens to be people talk and people don't talk about it. And also you can't really talk about it because once you talk, you you actually get talked down and bullied. There will be like 10 people who command, uh, oh, stay strong and we're with you. And then there is like 50 people who uh, DM you and they tell you like, oh, like uh, so luxurious your problems and oh, little girl got tired of traveling and blah, blah. But it's not about that. It's you only see it about travel. I mean, it's so much more than that. And you're kind of by society, you are a bit scared to talk or say how you feel, which is wrong. Everyone should be allowed to say how they feel. Right. Uh, and yeah, I deal with some issues. Some days it's better, some days it's worse, some days I, I feel great. I'm normally I'm a very happy and positive human being, but of course, hard day happened, and it's okay to talk about it. I think. Absolutely, yeah. That that's an important point. You know, people don't realize how much pressure you can receive from social media, okay. and and getting bullied and and all of that. I mean, and and you receive thousands of these comments. It's not just a few. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's so, also like very difficult with tennis players. Unfortunately, we are always available online. Uh, many even uh, clothing companies and racket companies, they actually require that you post regularly on social media. Also, all the live scores of any, even the smallest tennis event is available online. So you are always under the spotlight. And then regardless, you get a negative feedback, regardless if you win or if you lose. If you lose, okay, we, we got it, you lost. And there are so many match batters that lost money and they want to tell you and wish you everything bad. Then even if you win, there are so many you know know it all people who still tell you what did you do wrong and how can they help you and even though some people want to help you genuinely but it gets really annoying when every day you get like 20 30 messages of everyone wanting to fix your serve or a forehand mm -hmm. and even if you win sometimes someone loses money on you and they also text you and tell you <laughs> like why did you win today so so it gets a lot and then there's always like people that get offended that you don't answer them people that get offended that you answer them people get offended when you tell them what you think so it's actually a lot mm. to manage it's easier i guess for the top tier athletes who actually have people who take care of that stuff and their social media but obviously not everyone has that and mostly tennis players like my range the lower ranked players players in the medium ranking who don't have that much financial opportunity to hire all these people they have to do them themselves and it gets too much it gets yeah too, much. too many opinions Right. I can imagine that. Um, what do you do for mental toughness? I come from Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough, right? <laughs> I would say that's enough. Yeah, because, uh, you know, like we grew up in a country where throughout our childhood, we didn't have electricity or any hot water. Uh, my mom used to cook us uh, uh, an egg on a candlelight because we didn't have gas or any stove working. So... So that, that toughens you. You want it or no, you have no childhood anymore. You just learn how to survive and you roll with it. And that becomes a normality. But then when you put it in the perspective and you put yourself with other people, then you think that you, you start to appreciate that you handle many situations differently than other people. And then you start to learn about yourself. Yeah, I'm pretty tough, I guess. And yeah, I think that that's all I did. I think the way that 
that we had to be brought up and the way that we grew up made it all. Hmm. I don't think we need much extra. <laughs> right, right. Um, let's talk about nutrition. Uh, what's your diet like? Uh, I, I love nutrition. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's start with this. I love food. I'm really passionate about my food. I hate junk food. Like I, I never loved something like oh McDonald's burgers, or I never drink Coke or any soda. I'm, I'm not a fan of this, anyways. I really like high quality food, like high quality pizza, if it's Italian pizza. But I like it only in Italy. I will never go and buy Domino's pizza, for example. Okay. Like, I'm just going to, if I want a pizza, I'm going to make a pizza myself with the dough, with all the ingredients I know, and that's the pizza I'm going to eat. But mostly I'm trying to eat little carbs, uh, a lot of protein, and I like raw fruit, raw veggies. I have veggies in all my meals. Uh, I drink mostly water or coffee. If I want an alcoholic drink, once in a while, that's a wine and preferably red wine because it's still not that bad for you. And uh, yeah, I, I basically like mostly what I cook for myself. And since my husband by education is nutritionist and I made many nutrition courses because I'm also very interested in it, we try to substitute everything negative that can be in food with everything positive. Like we try to take wheat out, we put more spelt, more buckwheat flour, more uh, oat flour. We substitute dairy. We almost don't eat any dairy. I have my weakness. It's a burrata cheese. Mm -hmm. That that's most dairy I eat, but it happens rare, and but that's my weak spot. But we mostly eat plant milk, like uh, oat milk, almond milk, mostly because I'm a bit allergic to soy. I don't use any more soy milk, but yeah, so m very much plant based with addition of some protein. I would say if if we specify it more like specific, that's mostly plant based with some protein that comes from animals, but as little as possible because. We try to stay off animal products, but I personally feel very bad without it completely. I tried it, uh, didn't work well for my mm. body. So I'm um, trying to be mostly plant-based, but some protein in it. And as I said, if I need a cheat day, I'm cooking like a pizza myself or like homemade burger. And yeah, it also brings me a lot of joy to cook. So Okay, that's great. So what kind of meats do you do you eat? If I do have to eat meat, I really enjoy steak, like with a little bit of blood. I like carpaccio, which is uh, thin sliced uh, raw meat. But mostly, most meat that we eat is, I would say, chicken. Uh, we do drumsticks or chicken breast, and that's I would I would say that's the eighty percent of the meat we're consuming is mostly chicken because it's also. I don't trust really the meat quality in many countries and it's very hard to find like a really fresh, good butcher's meat in, once you travel for a week in different countries. Right. So the safest and easiest choice is always a chicken. Okay. Let's talk about your training regimen. When you're competing, okay. you're training. Um, what kind of training routine do you have? I would say uh, I'm a bit older now. I don't want to consider myself like old, but I'm over 30. So there's something I did never had. I learned it hard way with the injuries and burnouts that you shouldn't always push your body. Mm -hmm. I used to have this idea that no matter what happens in the world, you have to have four to six hours of training a day. Even if you're dying, even if you're sick, even if you're tired, you have to push through. Uh, now I learned very bad way that that's not the right way. So I would say... I try to listen to my body and there are actually some days where we play tennis for an hour with my husband, with my coach, with Tim, and uh, I just feel great and I say, okay, look, I really feel good. I don't really feel like I need to be doing something else and then we say, okay, and then some days we go hardcore and practice three or four hours, but I would say if we put it more, if we generalize it more like on a tournament day let's say i w wake up i do some warm-up like basic activation to prevent the injury if i have a match uh, late then i'll play one hour of tennis in the morning then i'll go have lunch warm up before my tennis match play a match uh, do some recovery like jogging stretching etc and that would be my day 
If I have a match in the morning, then I would just do activation. I would play 30 minutes of tennis and just go play a match and that would be it. And then depending on how I feel, I would do like some more fitness in the afternoon or some more tennis, depending what I feel like I need more. And if we take the days where I don't have tournament, I never play actually more than two, two and a half hours of tennis, to be honest. I used to play way more tennis because I was a bit more obsessed. Uh, and at this point of my life, I pay more attention to fitness, I would say. So it's it, it goes like two and two. So it's basically four hours of training. And if I come home, I do some more yoga or Pilates because th that's actually just for my mind, but it counts as a workout as well so sure. i would say my maximum when i'm not playing a tournament it's four and a half five hours but including yoga and the cool down so i'm i'm trying not to overdo it as much as i did before sometimes i still do we all do <laughs> yes yeah it got better <laughs> okay do you strength train with weights I do, I do, but we, we, we actually combine it a lot. It's not like I'm only going to gym and lift. We do a lot of TRX, we we'll do a lot of fitness with bands. Uh, so it's not only like I'm going to lift, like once in a week I would go to lift maybe twice and other times I do TRX and some other times I do bands. So it's not always the same training. I learned that it's not good for me when I do always the same things. I, I get injured. Uh, I'm getting way more tired and irritated and also when I lift a lot I don't feel good on court sometimes once in a while to be stronger but mostly I enjoy way more TRX and band training it works better for me okay what are your plans after you stop playing tennis for retirement actually I have so many of them <laughs> <laughs> that's great I, uh like I would love to do something for my home country, to be honest, but it's actually very difficult. It's not that easy. There's a lot of things going on with the politics right now. It's very difficult because we're very close to Russia and Ukraine. So there is a bit of difficult situation in a means like we have no war, of course, we're in peace. But it's always like this tension that, that you can feel. So it's very hard to be there or plan anything in the country because it's very uncertain at this point. Uh, I really like to coach, but little kids, which is <laughs> which is very uncommon because usually people that play tennis like to coach professionals to travel and stuff. I don't like that. Okay. I, I like to actually communicate with little children and also because they like you way more and they listen to you way better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I like more communication. Like I would, I would like to uh, create some company. I, I think about it for a while now. I would like to create some company where I could help some tennis players that don't have that financial support and try to help them manage them and create some possibilities for tennis players. Like. I was when I was a kid, like I would love to have a place where I could go and someone could tell me, you know, where to travel, how to travel, which tournaments is better to play. You know, I didn't know any of this. So I, it took me five, six years to figure out stuff. So I would like to be that place where people could figure out stuff. I don't really have it on the paper exactly how it's going, but I have a big idea and some notes. So I think I will be trying to do that. And since I have a law degree now, I think I can like try to make everything pretty if i'm allowed to say that so it's it aligns with bylaws of every tennis organization but it can also help tennis players in the way that tennis organizations don't oh that's wonderful you have a plan i mean one of the biggest problems for athletes right now is is how they're going to transition from this sport to corporate life or you know some other activity that they can do outside of their sport but you have it all figured out that's wonderful yeah, my big problem is that I always had a lot of activities outside of a tennis court. That was my one of the biggest obstacles for the tennis court. So <laughs> that's the other way around here. <laughs> I mean, but that serves as an advantage for you, though. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes too much to think. But yes, I, I, would, I would say in general, it's 80% advantage. Yeah. So what other activities do you have right now outside of uh, tennis? 
Well, actually, I just finished my university where I took the law degree and I was thinking to do a master's degree, but I was actually really tired, to be honest. So I postponed it for a year, I would say. And I'm studying German right now because I passed an exam of A1 and A2, but I'm trying to learn a better language because I'm also living here. Uh, I'm working on a website, actually. I'm posting some blog posts. I don't know if you read them or no, but I'm trying to put it all in the website, like a little more professionally. And I'm right now on ITF Players Panel, uh, which also takes some time and effort. And many players come with you with questions and uh, some people don't know rules. And, you know, there are always young kids who don't know the rules, don't know how to handle some situations on the tournament. So that requires some time. Well, and obviously, I have my family responsibilities and, well, practicing and playing. It's some mixture. That's great. So as soon as your website is finished, um, please let me know, and I will definitely share that with our community and put it on your business listing page as well. Oh, that could be great. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And uh, your blog posts, wh where can we find those? I used to post them. I used to post them on the Wix site. It was called Tennis with Sophia. But it didn't get the audience that I liked also because um, people around me and the audience was not really like tennis related. So it didn't like get a catch that I wanted. And I just started to post like some pieces of it on Instagram, actually, uh, because it's easy to read. It's short texts. And I have the community that's actually interested in my followers actually like me because I'm a tennis player. So the people that actually read it are interested in what they read. So the future plan is to post a little paragraph of a blog post on Instagram and then add the link where you can follow and obviously read it on my website. But at this point, I'm just sharing it on Instagram and Facebook. Okay, great. It isn't works. Awesome. So you're on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, are you on yeah. any other social media oh, no, this is pages? This is, this is more than enough. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> this is more. I'm not that much on Facebook, to be honest. It's just linked to my Instagram. So when I post on Instagram, it automatically shows up on a Facebook, but I'm never on there. So I'm mostly on Instagram and LinkedIn. And, and, and it is more than enough. <laughs> right, right. Believe me, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can imagine. Yep, great. So, Sophia, it's been such a pleasure to have you on our show today. Do you have any last words for... Um, Children, they could be boys or girls that are coming up and they have an aspiration of being a professional tennis player. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It was a nice chat. Absolutely. Uh, what I could, I could, I could, well, first I would advise every kid to get an education because it is very important. Sport is a very difficult thing and athletic, like, professional athletes career is short and sometimes gets shortened by injuries and unfortunately we never can uh, su suspect how they happen so it's very important to have an education outside of tennis you have to have a second option even even if you never use it I hope you will get to top 10 top five in the world but you still need to have something in the back of your head that you know that okay if this won't work out I have this so then you're more quiet and uh, even helping you as a tennis player. And second, as a person who comes from nothing, basically, and with nothing, I would tell you that if you have a goal and if you're willing to go and do what it takes to achieve your goal, it's worth it. It's going to work out one way or another. You might not be in top 10, but you will be in top 100. You might not win a Grand Slam, but you'll be in a Grand Slam. You'll participate in every tournament you want. And maybe you win it. And it's going to be great. If you want to do it, just do it. Don't listen to anyone. Everything can be achieved from anything. Wonderful advice. Thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching Victory Circle Podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel.